The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And it is a grand day to be in the house of the Lord and to hear this. And, and what a great group all the way across there. Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. You all are fantastic, and I, I thank God for you. I have come loose from here, folks. I got I to gotta do something with this thing. <laughs> um, as we share uh, um, announcements this morning, uh, don't forget about, uh, of course, Bible study Wednesday and, uh, and then chancel choir and bells and then card ministry is April. The, I looked at that April the 3rd and then I realized, yeah, we're at the end of March. Where has this year gone? Amen. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, don't forget about these. Also, if you're a, a visitor, you, uh, please fill out a um, um, pew card and uh, just a visitor's card so we can have your contact information. If you'd like to know more about the church, just see... Uh, Doug or myself or anyone else, they can in this church. They can tell you uh, about everything about this church, and they'll be glad to have you. Amen. Also, uh, if you have prayer requests, um, you can bring them up, and uh, I will take them up right there, or put them back there uh, if you like. Put them back with the offering plate. By the way, our, our two offering boxes. There's one here, and there's one at the back that you can place your offerings in. I uh, just wanted to, to remind you about that. Um, and you can also email your uh, prayer request or any other request in. And there's the, uh, the um, yeah, that, uh, that email address thing uh, right there. I just about forgot what I was saying there. Any other announcements? Let's see. Well, good morning. We're going to start with a United Methodist hymnal, uh, the Rescue the Perishing, hymn 591. Rescue the Perishing. We'll stand and sing all verses together, hymn 591. Perishing, care for the dying. 
as we, as we share our praises and concerns this morning, I wonder if there is one who has a praise they'd like to lift up to the Lord. Praise Him. Miss Lee. Jan Stanley. All right, praise the Lord. So Jan Stanley. Hallelujah. Clean bill, uh, bill of health. And, and as you say, been on the prayer list for many years, two years. And so praise be to God for that. God is good all the time. Could I get a witness on that? Amen. All right. We, you know, it is wonderful just to praise the Lord. Any other praises? Well, I praise God for you. Amen. I praise God that you're here. And I praise God that we have an opportunity to worship. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's time to worship. And I, I, I love that. Um, do remember uh, Larry Addison in your prayers. James Kennedy and Carlos and, and Rebecca Mosley um, in your prayers. Continue to remember Mary Japansky and all her family, um, and uh, Martha, Jesse, and also Phil as they continue their therapy and, and their recovery from surgery, uh, and continue to lift up Greg uh, Wilson and Corey and Robin Blankenship um, and Stephanie McReynolds, Wayne and Beverly Lester, and Susie Davis and, and uh, Rick Chitwood. Ernie Deal, Sandra Massey, Marvin and Patsy, and, and um, Margaret Ellen and their family, very much in prayer. Lou and Sarah Ballenberger, and Doug, continue to lift up Doug in your prayer because he, he has still a few more hurdles to go, and he definitely needs our prayers uh, to get him over the hump and, um, and get him back to where uh, you know, he's kicking at least that high. And uh, he just, you know, he told me the other day, he couldn't, he, he said, well, I can't get in a climb a tree, a tree stand yet. And, uh, but let's pray that when he can. But also we miss Doug and, and, uh, and we need our photographer back again. Amen. Um, and, and then, of course, Dean and Nancy continue to lift them up. Unspoken request by the uplift of hands. Let us pray. What a gorgeous day that you have set before us. It's interesting, Lord, that how, <clears throat> that as humans, at least I'll, I'll say for me, Lord, that um, when the sun is shining, it's a beautiful day, our spirits soar a little more. But Lord God, we're just so grateful for all that you give us and all that you bring to us. For without the rain, nothing would grow. The trees that we see sprouting, the flowers that are coming up, and future ones, Lord, they need the sunshine, but they need the rain. Lord, in the same manner, we need the sunshine, we need the rain to help us grow, to trust in you, to believe in you. To seek you, to seek your word, to know, Lord, uh, your will and purpose for our lives. Lord, sustain us as you have so many times. And so many times in, in your word, we read about how you sustained and provided for the people. Lord God, sustain my brothers and sisters this morning. Lord, fill them to overflowing. Lift up, we lift up this service, Lord, to your attention, to your presence, to your anointing. Have your own way, O oh Lord. Oh, we're just so grateful to hear the news about Jan Stanley. Ask that you would continue to bless and lift her up and and, and to guide her. 
But Lord, we also ask for healing on so many that we have named this morning, including those, Lord, that are in our hearts as we raised our hands. I'm so grateful that, Lord, you see the heart, you know the, the, the need, you, above all, Lord, before we know, you know. Because you are an omnipotent God. You know, you see. You're an omniscient God. You're a caring and, and compassionate and loving God. You're a just God. And Lord, that's why we can bring our petitions to you. And we know that we have a Savior that is sitting right by your side, on the right side, making intercessions. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray through the utterings and the groanings of the Holy Spirit as we lift up our, our requests that you would hear and make known before the Father for his, God, uh, for his grace and mercy and his healing upon our country, upon our church, upon the prisons and the nursing homes, the hospitals, the assisted living. Lord, for those who are don't know you as their personal Savior, may we be the witness. May the church be the witness that we lead and witness to, to people about you, Jesus. That they may know, too know and come to the wisdom and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his salvation. May the unconcerned believe again and commit their lives to you. Holy Spirit, come, engulf us. For those who are not feeling well, Lord, even here, pour out your Spirit upon them. Have mercy, O oh God. Forgive us, Lord, where we have failed you, where we're weak, where we have sinned, because we are sinners saved by grace. We are in the flesh. And we don't mean for the cardinal person to come out, but Lord, sometimes we get ahead of you. Forgive us. This morning, may we hear from heaven and hear to your will and your purpose. As we pray the prayer Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom, a power, and glory forever. Amen and amen.
you will notice there are two hymns in here for our special music. The first one, which you just heard, is Old Sacred Head Now Wounded, which is in our bulletin. And I'm going to read you a portion of the words. Old Sacred Head Now Wounded, with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns thine only crown. How pale thou art with anguish, with sore and abuse and scorn. And then the next one is also in her hymn, No When I Survey. I'm going to read you a portion of that. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? These two hymns were written at two different times. O Sacred Head was war written in the Middle Ages by a monk. And Isaac Watts wrote When I Survey in the 1700s. But yet, they speak of the same thing. They speak of uh, Christ's sacrifice and pain and the wounds that the, he suffered. So no matter the time, we still remember and look back. So during Lenten season, this is our time to look back and think of all his sacrifice for his death and what he gave to us. I think they deserve another round of applause. Amen.
If you've never tried to play the handbells, it, you, you need to, to challenge yourself to do that. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy, but they are so beautiful. They sound so beautiful. And, that, and of course, both of those hymns, especially the uh, old sacred head now wounded, isn't that a, a goody? Um, we ought to sing at least twice a year, at least, but you know, more. But I, I just love the the, the hymns, and because um, um, you know, sometimes we just don't sing enough hymns. And uh, but they were that was great. Hallelujah. All righty. This is a continuation from last Sunday, uh, from 1 Kings chapter 17. Um, and um, if you remember um, from last week, God has sent <clears throat> Elijah to the Corith Ravine down by the brook Cherith. And there he is being sustained by God. Um, and that's where we left him, God sustaining him, providing for them. And um, we're going to pick up there uh, this week, and we're going to move on with where uh, else, the, the other exploits of Elijah. Let us pray. Father God, I just praise your holy name for your word, for an opportunity to read your word to expound upon your word, but Lord, this is your word, your inspired word. Lord, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that it will be rightly divided, rightly proclaimed, and rightly understood to our glory, uh, to our edification, and to your glory, and to our following you. Bless, O oh Lord, now we ask in the reading and the hearing of your word and the proclamation of your word. And we pray this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen and amen. As you are able, would you stand for the reading of God's word beginning at verse 7 of chapter 17 of 1 Corinthians and after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. You've got to remember there was a, a drought on at this time. Then the word of the Lord came to him, meaning Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he rose and went to Zarephath, and, went, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. In other words, a small loaf. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. Boy, I tell you what, you, I could preach a whole lot of different sermons in this and, and part of it. Think about what she, and she went and did as Elijah said, obedience, faithfulness. And she and her household <clears throat> ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent. In other words, never run dry. 
Neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that was spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring, you've come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. You've got to remember, in that day and time, they believed that the, the sins of the father and the sins of the mother would go to as much as the fourth generation. So it was, it was commuted to them. And so she's saying, is this what has happened? Um, did my sin cause this? And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him <clears throat> from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lay lodged and laid him on his bed. And he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came to him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And I want you to keep that in mind. Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord uh, in your mouth is truth. If you remember, <clears throat> back in November 21, back when we had our, our refresh event, um, the Reverend Dr. J. Ferguson made a statement during that event, and this is what he said. We have to move the trough. We have to move the trough. And I like to say we have to move our trough. Now, what did he mean by that? What he meant was that we have gotten used to being in one place. It's gotten messy. It's too familiar. It's too convenient. And to do real ministry, we have to move the trough and the place where we eat and we work and we live. I grew up on a farm. And one thing that I learned early on was that you don't feed, whether it's the cattle, horses, sheep. I mean, we had the cattle, sheep, hogs, you know. And one of the things, you never fed in the same place day after day. Even, even in the trough where we fed the grain and the silage, Periodically through the winter, it was moved because, you know, the cattle uh, would stand there and they'd eat, and before long it was just mud, mud and muck and mire, and they were sinking up to their uh, bellies nearly, and we'd have to move them. Neighbor of, my, uh, of ours, I, I remember how it just it bothered me for years and years and years. It bothered me because he always fed in the same place. Whether it was his cattle or his horses, he fed in the same place. He'd just go up there at the barn, get the, the, the hay out and just throw it in the same muck and mire. All of that nasty around there and, and, and those poor old beasts. You know, well, he'd throw all their, their good hay out there. They'd have to try to pick through that. And then, you know, they were trying to get a meal out of all of that garbage. Or like I, I, I think many times we said, that slop. <laughs> One of the things that my, not only my dad, but my grandpa taught me was that you don't become complacent in what you are doing, especially 
tending your herd. You don't become complacent. If you become complacent, you'll eat in the same place and you'll never move your trough. All right, let's look at Elijah because God was about to ask him to do something. <clears throat> Elijah was to learn, yeah, well, let me say this. He was about to learn a lesson about not becoming complacent where he was. Now, I want you to think about this, folks. He was having it a good time. He was, you know, God was taking care of him. He was there in, by that brook in that ravine. Ravens were bringing him food and water, or food and meat, and he had water there. And he was communing with God, as we talked last week. You know, we, we need that place of isolation to get in communion with God. And he was, he was in a grand place. But God didn't want him to become comfortable. God didn't want him to be complacent. And after a while, because of the, the drought, the stream dried up. In other words, God was about to have Elijah move his trough. You got, to, you got to get up from where you are and move. Folks, many churches haven't moved so, in so long that they don't hardly know what's outside the four walls. And, and, and don't say he's, he, went, he went from preaching to meddling. Amen? But I want you to think about this. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Now, first of all, Elijah was in a relationship with God that when God spoke, he heard the word of God. What do you think he was doing all that time in isolation? That's why I, I, last week I talked about the importance of being in an isolated place, being in a place where you can hear from God. And the word of God came to Elijah. Brothers and sisters, the Word of God needs to come to you and this church and myself. Amen. And we need to be able to hear that Word in order to move. The Word of the Lord came to Elijah. Praise God for the relationship that Elijah had with God. Now, I want you to think about something. As God was asking him to move his trough. Moving your trough is not easy. You have to get into all that has accumulated around your trough and pull your trough up out of all that is accumulated. Pull up out of the comfort, the ease, the familiarity, the complacency, We've never done it like that before, and we're never going to do it like that. Amen? We have to pull up from that. Folks, it, it, listen, in, you know, this is not this church. It's not the United Methodist Church. It's a lot of churches. God has blessed us so much, and we've gotten used to where we are. And all the while, there are people dying and going to hell. There's people dying, not knowing Christ. There's people who have left and become unconcerned about their relationship with Jesus Christ and with the church and being a part of it because we have become comfortable in what we're doing as a church. Moving your trough gets uncomfortable. I'll tell you a little story. If you don't think it's messy, my daddy told me one time we were, we had these long trawls, and, and you know, you've heard the old saying, uh, uh, go big or go home. My daddy believed in, in big. It, those trawls were about 10, 12 foot long, and they were about three and a half, four foot wide. And after they had been in that muck and mire for a while, we had to move them in order we could continue to feed the insulates in it. And so we get in there and we're, you know, we get up there and get that. And it's just him and me, him on one side and me on the other. And we pick that thing up and we're going to go this way. And that means I've got to back up. 
And as I start to make that first move, my boots stick in that, and he shoves. Foo. Right in the midst of all of that. Now, my daddy didn't say, go clean yourself up. He said, get your boots out of there and get that in and let's move. And we moved those troughs. Then I had to ride home like that. My mama wouldn't let me in the house. Folks, I want you to hear what I'm saying. Elijah had to go. And, it's, and the church needs to get out of its comfort zone. Elijah was comfortable where he was, but he is being told you need to go somewhere else. It takes work to move our troughs. It takes work to get out of our comfort zone. It takes work to, to get out of our, our easy chair. It takes work to get out of our pews. It takes work to move for the kingdom of heaven. Elijah, you know, he would eventually go to Mount Carmel and where he would challenge the prophets of Baal. But first, you know, he has to move from that brook in that ravine to a house in Zarephath where he would meet a widow and, and stay there a while. Bef and he had to do this before he could ever climb the mountain to meet the prophets of Baal. Brothers and sisters, before we climb the mountain, we have to move the trough, and we may have to move it several times. Amen? Could I get a witness on that? Elijah had to move his trough to a different place and to a different set of circumstances. God send his, sends him to Zarephath. And so let's look at this. He had already prepared a widow to take care of Elijah. Elijah goes to the gate of the city, and there he sees this widow gathering up sticks to build a fire. She's going to make a meal. She has just enough flour and oil to, to make one more meal for her and her son before they die. And Elijah says to her, woman, would you get me something to drink? Now, the code of hospitality would, uh, would demand that she would do just that. As she was going to go get the, the water, he said, and would you bring me a morsel of bread, something to eat? And that's when she tells him, look, all I have is just this little morsel of, of, of flour and oil. It's just enough for my son and, and myself and I'm going to bake it, and then we're going to die because we don't have anything else. And, and Elijah said, just go make me a cake first. Brothers and sisters, what are you going to do? That's all you have. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, it looks like that's all we have is one little morsel left. Amen? Sometimes in our lives, it seems like we don't have enough and we fixate on that and we begin to to think about that and and we think about how can I give to this or how can I do that how can I pay my tithes how can I blah 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 and on and on and on the woman went and made him a cake of bread because Elijah told her if you'll do that then that jug of, of flour will never run empty and your oil will never run out and do you know, in all of the time that was left until God sent the rain, the flour bin was never empty and the oil jar was never empty. God provided for them. God sustained them. But, I want you to think about this. Sometimes, Where we move the trough, it becomes hard. It may even be messy, but I want to say hard. But we need to keep the faith. We need to keep trusting and watch God and watch what God will do. Because, listen, there was a tragedy about to happen in this, the life of this widow. She was being a faithful person. She was faithful to God. She did as Elijah said. She took care of Elijah. 
she was blessed by God. All three of them ate, and, but then a tragic event happened. Her son grew, uh, became ill and died. And she looks at Elijah and said, what have you done, O man of God? Why? I mean, you know, and, and how many of us have not said on many different accounts and, and, and for different reasons, why? You know, it's like that old song, that, that, the gospel song, Why Me, Lord? What did I ever do? Yeah, well, what did we do? But I want you to think about this. She had more to learn. Elijah had to follow through being the man of God. And she had to learn more from God. Now, and I want you to think is because, I, folks, many times we, we put these things in our minds. And yes, God could have healed this child any way he chose. He could have prevented the, the, the boy from dying at all. But God chose to use his faithful servant, the man who called on God's name. And through this event, God got the glory for what he was going to do and what he did do. And this event taught the widow to fully trust in God. Folks, we can be faithful, and I know you're faithful. But sometimes it takes an extra ounce, an extra, an extra yard, an extra throw to get us to trust fully in the God that we know can deliver. Elijah moved his trough as God directed. That is, he was willing to go where God directed him. To stay in that circumstances until the time for him to move again. Now I want you to think about this. In each place, the ravine, the widow's house, and soon to be Mount Carmel, Elijah was sustained by God who provided for him, taught him obedience, taught him patience, a willingness to be a faithful servant, and then God did as God told him. So church, we as the people of God and the disciples of Jesus Christ have to be willing to move our trough. In other words, change our ways of doing. Change our ways. Change and become a child of God. If you don't know, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus is your personal Savior, then the first step you need to make is to become a child of God. Amen? You need to repent of your sins and call upon the name of the Lord and say, God, forgive me, a sinner. I want to be what you want me to be. But then it also requires each one of us, and I'm going to say, folks, before I preach this sermon to you, I preached this sermon about seven times to myself. Amen? And I kept pointing the fingers, and you notice it, sometimes I go like that, but you notice how many fingers are back this way, amen? Because I too have to be willing to move the trough. And I'm going to tell you what, as clergy and laity, we have to get out of that comfort zone. Not be complacent, but be willing to eat and work where God leads You've begun to move your trough. Amen? You've begun. You're starting to move. But where else might God ask you to move your trough? Where else might God ask you to move your trough outside any of these four walls? Where else might God lead you and what might you yet experience in your faithful service to God. I'm going to tell you what, folks. When you get out there and when you start working and you, you're willing to move your trough and you're willing to, get, willing to get out of your comfort zone and you're willing to do and go where God leads, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have a time. You're going to have a time. You're going to experience 
the beauty and the presence of God. You're going to feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You're going to see lives change. You're going to see the radiance of God all around. And praise be to God. There, there's nothing like... I remember a time when a guy... I know, i got to hurry. I remember a time when a guy... They'd been coming to church. He never made a commitment to the Lord. And the conviction of the Lord was so much on him, he called a couple of members of the church. And he said... Y'all got to come pray with me. You got to come and pray with me. See, he didn't call a preacher. He called two members of the church out of my home church. So you got to come. And they said, well, we'll come. If you want, we'll come right to your house. He said, never mind. Just meet me halfway. They met halfway on the side of the four lane. And he received Christ as his personal savior right then and there. He needed Jesus now. Those folks, all three of them, the next, Sunday, the next Sunday in church, my goodness, there was, a, there was a hallelujah all around. They were shouting, praising God. They was telling about the wonderful things that had happened on the side of a road when someone needed Jesus and gave their life to Jesus. Folks, that can still happen. I believe God's the same today as he was yesterday, and he'll be the same tomorrow. But the truth is, We've got not to be complacent. We've got to be, to get out of our comfort zone. Because God, I want you to think, God has been good to us. Amen? That was weak. Amen. That's a little better. You're getting there. And you know what? For years and years and years, the church flourished. I've heard your stories. You've heard my stories. You've told them, I've told them, seeing the altar rail filled with people crying out to God. People seeking God. Good saints of God just saying, God, I'm not where I need to be, I'm not where I want to be, but I want to be where you want me to be. Move my trough. Many times we, we and, I, and I can attest, preaching today is different than it was 30 years ago. Has God changed? No. Has the Spirit of God changed? No. I think we've changed. What will it take, and folks, you know, the Word of God teaches me in Acts that, that in the latter days God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. I want the Spirit of God to pour out His, His, His Spirit upon us. Amen. Folks, we need to have a heart for the lost, the least, the last, those that are hurting. And you do a wonderful job in a lot of things. Don't get me wrong. You do. You reach out to a lot of people. But, but brothers and sisters, we can even become comfortable in our outreach. And we can com become complacent. Man, this brook is grand. You know, we do the same thing over and over and over, and we get just comfortable with what we're doing. Thank you, Jesus, for, for feeding us. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us meat and bread, and I got this brook right here. But then what does it do when it dries up? And then, folks, the church is drying up. Do you hear me? Can I get a witness on that? The church is drying up. Maybe not you, but the church is drying up. Look around. If, if the Spirit of God, you know, if, if we had gotten out of our comfort zone, our complacency, and, and seek to fill every place, every pew, wouldn't you love to see every place filled, every pew filled, and have to put chairs down the aisles? Could I get a witness? Well, if you, you said amen, so you done committed yourself. I knew that preacher was up to something. Forgive me for being comfortable. God, forgive me for being complacent. Loving my place by the brook. Loving my place in the widow's house. And never going up to Mount Carmel to do battle. To win the souls. 
that so desperately need Jesus. Are you ready to move your trough? Amen. Thank you. Are you ready to move your trough? Brothers and sisters, are you ready to move your trough? It's going to take work. It's going to take work because, folks, we've dug in deep. And that trough is deep. And it means that we're going to have to really dig around those, those old legs and we're going to have to start doing some <laughs> to get it up and get it going. But there's souls out there that needs Jesus. Folks, as we stand and sing this morning, I ask this commitment, God, I've loved it here by the brook. I've loved it here in the widow's house. But it's time for me to go to Mount Carmel. So help me move my trough and go where you lead me as we sing. If you will, turn in the faith we sing to 2241. The Spirit sends us forth to serve. Hymn 2241 in the faith we sing. We'll stand, all, stand and sing all verses of hymn 2241 in the faith we sing. The Spirit sends us forth to serve. We go in Jesus' name. We go in Jesus' name. And may we go in Jesus' name today. Amen. Father God, send us forth in your love and your grace. Father, send us. Lord, inspire us, help us to move our trough and to go forth in your name, in the name of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, that others may come to know him and know of the joy of your salvation. Send us forth now in your love and in your grace, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.